This is five on your side at four, focused on you. First at four, a judge hears arguments in a high-stakes court battle to kick the abortion question off the November ballot in Missouri. The last-minute case coming after a circuit court ruled the Secretary of State's proposed ballot language was unfair, inaccurate, and misleading. Thanks for being here. I'm Kay Quinn. Brent Solomon has the day off. Missouri election officials are preparing to print the ballots voters will use to make their voices heard this fall. A court faces a Tuesday deadline to decide if that abortion question will appear. Political editor Mark Maxwell joins us from the newsroom with more details on these legal challenges. Mark? Good afternoon, Kay. We're witnessing the last-ditch effort here from anti-abortion activists to kick this abortion question off the ballot. A judge faces that Tuesday deadline and did hear arguments today over whether that 380,000 voters who signed petitions to put the question on the ballot really knew all the implications of what it might entail. Today's hearing comes after a circuit court just last night had to rewrite the fair ballot language and strike down the description from Republican Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft. The court called Ashcroft's language unfair, inaccurate, insufficient, and misleading in several places. Now, we see how the language could actually appear on the ballot. The court's rewrite says a yes vote would, quote, remove Missouri's ban on abortion. Opponents argued the scope is too broad and far-reaching to fit into just one ballot question. This is clear cut. The court should permit, whenever possible, a vote of the people on an initiative and must act with restraint, trepidation, and a healthy suspicion of the partisans who would use the judiciary to prevent the initiative process from taking its course. They have not treated the voters with the respect that the Constitution requires and that they need to go home and start over. They are not to be on the ballot. The most pressing question for the judge right now is, does it make legal sense to kick something off the Friday before ballots are to be printed on a Tuesday? Um, and the answer to that is no. One interesting note here, the judge presiding over this case is Chris Limbaugh, cousin to the late Rush Limbaugh. Governor Mike Parson appointed him to the bench just one year before the governor enacted the most restrictive ban on abortion in the nation. All right, thank you, Mark. A jury has awarded two St. Louis families $462 million after finding a tractor trailer manufacturer responsible for the deaths of two young fathers. The men were killed in a so called underride accident in May of 2019 along I 4455 near the 7th Street exit. Their car slid underneath the back of a tractor trailer, pinning and killing them. These types of crashes are part of a deadly trend that has many calling for tighter regulation. The lawsuit claimed the company that built the tractor trailers failed to build safer rear impact guards. No one has done anything to try to solve the problem because they haven't been forced to. And we hope that, you know, the jury's message, the loud and clear message they sent changes that perspective, that people stop looking at it as, you know, a nuisance device on the rear of a trailer, but instead of what it is and should be, which is a safety device. A jury found the trailer manufacturer, Wabash National Corporation, responsible for the deaths of 30-year-old Teron Taylor and 23-year-old Nicholas Perkins. Five on Your Side's Justina Coronel will have much more on this story tonight on Five on Your Side at 5 and 6. The community in Monroe County continues to rally together as they grieve and remember a teen killed in a crash last weekend. In just a few hours, the Columbia High School football team will honor Crawford Bryant. The 15-year-old sophomore died Sunday in a traffic crash. During tonight's game against rival Waterloo, players and fans from both teams will wear orange and blue in a show of unity. A local business is joining in the effort to honor Bryant. Freshly pressed made hundreds of shirts, buttons and stickers. All proceeds will go to the Columbia Soccer Club since Bryant was on the varsity soccer team. Freshly pressed sold out of the shirts yesterday. Tonight, the Melville community is supporting Ferguson officer Travis Brown. The Melville football team and booster club created shirts to raise money for the injured officer. They'll also collect donations at tonight's Melville Northwest game. Brown graduated from Melville in 2006. The officer remains in a coma after suffering a brain injury last month after being tackled by a protester. The Bi-State saw cooler temperatures today after yesterday's heat. And the days ahead promise to be more fall-like. Meteorologist Jim Castillo in for Scott. He has a first look at the forecast. Yeah, you know, we had that front come through here, and now that breeze is beginning to pick up. Still a warm day. You know, we're in the 80s. A beautiful shot there of St. Charles and Interstate 70 looking good. 
But you know, the shocking thing is that after sunset tonight, it's going to be really chilly. It's going to feel it. You're going to definitely need a jacket as you're headed out to maybe the football games this evening or even the Cardinals game. So don't forget the jacket. And there is that front to the east of us. A lot of showers and storms have developed out ahead of that from Cincinnati all the way down into Louisville. Uh, but from St. Louis to Columbia to Kansas City, it's cleared nicely. And again, those clouds that we had earlier are gone. It's still 82 degrees. So like I said, though, after sunset, you know, that humidity is about 33% and that northwest breeze at 15 miles an hour is going to make it feel pretty chilly. All right, we'll have much more on our forecast for the weekend coming up. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you, Jim. The 14-year-old Georgia school shooting suspect and his father appeared in court today. Wednesday's attack left two students and two teachers dead. The alleged shooter is expected to be tried as an adult and could face life in prison. His father has also been charged and could face up to 180 years in prison. Michael Yoshida reports on the latest from Georgia. Shackled and escorted into a Georgia courtroom, long hair covering his face, the teenager accused of carrying out a deadly school shooting facing a judge. In essence, you're charged with four counts of felony murder. Family members of the victims watching on, some wiping tears, another seen holding a stuffed animal, sitting just feet away from the teen charged with killing two students and two teachers during Wednesday's shooting at a high school in North Georgia. Shortly after his son, Colin Gray, led into the same courtroom, the 54-year-old appearing emotional. He and his son were questioned last year about online threats to commit a school shooting, but the case was closed. Several months later, investigators say he bought the AR-style gun used in the shooting as a present for his son. That, according to two law enforcement sources. These charges stem from Mr. Gray knowingly allowing his son, Colt, to possess a weapon. The arrest and charging of an accused school shooter's parent reminiscent of the recent landmark case in Michigan, where Jennifer and James Crumbly were sentenced to prison time. The first time parents were held criminally responsible for a mass school shooting committed by their child. A lot of this case is going to depend on what the father knew or should have known. Neither the alleged shooter nor his father entered a plea on Friday. Prosecutors say additional charges are expected to be filed in this case. In Washington, I'm Michael Yoshida reporting. Nine other people injured in Wednesday's shooting, including seven who suffered gunshot wounds, are expected to make a full recovery. It's been two years since the rollout of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. To date, the hotline has helped millions of people. Sunday will become the first ever 988 Day, a new tradition aimed at raising awareness and ending the stigma around mental health help. The director of the 988 Crisis Coordinating Office says many still don't know they can dial three numbers to get one-on-one -on -one mental health help. Calls are answered by counselors in more than 200 crisis contact centers all across the U.S. Rather that's a mental health crisis, people experiencing depression, anxiety, um, people having concerns about substance misuse, and et cetera. So it's for any type of crisis. If you are struggling, anyone struggling can call or text the three-digit crisis line. 988 Day is Sunday, September 8th. September is also National Suicide Prevention Month. Unsettling health problems emerge at a maximum security prison in Illinois. Why so many guards have needed care at a hospital. Former President Trump made an appearance in a Manhattan courtroom this morning. What happened during his attempt to appeal a guilty verdict in a sexual abuse case? The St. Louis region is famous for its festivals. Wait until you hear the one set for this weekend that celebrates Missouri's state fruit.